Ladies, thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here and to have been asked to moderate uh, the next 20 minutes, during which we're going to be talking about what's been titled the Great Balancing Act. And um, as working mothers, working women in this room, we're not just going to be talking about that balancing act that we deal with every day, but a geopolitical balancing act and the economic balancing act as well. Um, it's no surprise to any of you in this room that over the last few years, uh, the world has been rocked by forces such as increasing political polarization, uh, the rise of populism, and also trade protectionism as well. So these are the kind of issues we're going to be getting into with our two uh, illustrious guests, Your Excellencies, High Commissioners. So first of all, let me start out uh, with you, uh, your, your Excellency, High Commissioner Rishi. The Indian subcontinent, South Asia, has also had a tumultuous year, hasn't it? Economically, where do you think it's going to go from here? You're fresh out of an election cycle. What's going to be the trajectory for India? Thank you so much, uh, Nina, and I think we can disp dispense with uh, the Your Excellency bit. We, we can be friends here. Uh, it's such a pleasure to be here uh, among such uh, illustrious gathering of most powerful women. I don't really count myself in that group, uh, but it's nice uh, to have this thought for, for at least this one morning. So uh, yes, it is a very interesting time for India. We had a five year long uh, government led by our Prime Minister, Prime Minister Modi, uh, and he has uh, been re returned with a bigger mandate. In India, this is uh, very, uh, unusual because we have a very large electorate, a very large, diverse uh, country, uh, an electorate that is uh, over 900 million people, registered voters. So it is a very large country and it is uh, therefore um, a good thing that we have a strong government which uh, can continue to take uh, steps forward uh, for opening up our economy, for uh, you know, making India more welcoming of people, better delivery of services for our people. And um, so I hope that the trajectory is going to be very positive. Obviously, the balancing act that you're dealing with is enormous if you look at the size of the Indian population. Demographics come into play. When it comes to Bangladesh, you've got a population of 165 five million people, which is well over double what it was when your country was actually founded at the start of the 1970s. So what exactly does a nation like Bangladesh have to balance at the moment in terms of the things that, that really is the most challenging? I think that you know, Bangladesh's economic growth right now, which is really, it's just leapfrogging. You know, this year, the economic growth expected rate is 8.13%. Last year, it was 7.86%. So currently, we are in this club of seven of those countries, there are five Asian countries and two African countries, who are actually leapfrogging, including India, you know, who are expected to, whose uh, per capita growth is supposed to go more than double in next seven to eight years. So um, how do we keep up with that kind of economic growth and the sustainability of that and the risk factors involved in that, particularly with large populations, extreme weather conditions, some of the risk factors are there, climate change, I think it's the biggest challenge, is you know Bangladesh's um, uh, coastal line is supposed to go inundated by 2050, and there will be about 30 million people who might be climate displaced. So we're focusing in making Bangladesh more resilient. So climate resilience is going to be a major focus to cut down risks. And part of this all comes in the international context of international diplomacy. Uh, you are two women who have some of the most important positions for your countries, diplomatically speaking, as ambassadors for your nations. Um, when it comes to the United Kingdom, obviously this is a very interesting time to be a high commissioner of your countries because of Brexit. And the UK is aggressively looking elsewhere to forge partnerships with countries like yours. Well, currently, you know, we enjoy, um, we are still, I mean, last year Bangladesh entered the process of LDC graduation. And, um, you know, I mean, uh, not only is our economic growth very strong and robust, but our social indicators are very strong as well. You know, in the World Economic Forum gender gap uh, report, Bangladesh is competing with countries or standing next to countries such as Iceland or Norway, whose <coughs> per capita income is 65,000 US dollars plus, and ours is under 2,000. When it comes to political empowerment of women, we're in the first 
top five countries in the world. So, you know, um, what I'm trying to say is that, you know, in, in, in this new world order, which is actually polycentric and multipolar and quite unpredictable, uh, both like, you know, business and politics is quite disruptive behavior. And in, within that, what we are trying to focus on is our immediate neighborhood. So, you know, regional connectivity, power grid that Bangladesh shares with India. These are the very uh, comforting, you know, zones that we enjoy. We're just trying to focus on our neighborhood and uh, create this, uh, you know, power, energy grids, uh, dependability, trust. So I think basically the world is suffering from a trust deficit everywhere. But having good relations with the neighbors is extremely important. As we know, we're surrounded in three sides by India, and we share about 4,000 plus kilometers of common border. So our relationship is, you know, the basic tenets of security, trade. There's a huge dependability on these areas. And in fact, so I think that's our common prosperity tenet where we work together, and this is how Bangladesh is looking. Your nations aren't just friends. You're personally friends, aren't you? <laughs> yes, <Wow>. we are. <laughs> yeah, we're very good friends. Yeah, very our good countries friends. are very good friends. <laughs> And you, By the way, she's the first um, foreign service, I mean, woman, um, well, high commissioner from the foreign, Indian Foreign Service in, in London, and so am I, and it really surprises me that, you know, I mean, Indian, uh, you know, would a first woman uh, high commissioner. So definitely, you know, yes, these are very important positions, London, you asked me, and, um, you know, I think we've bro broken the glass ceiling to get here. It's, it's quite difficult because these are stereotypically, you know, very reserved for men. I mean, having said that, though, all three of our nations have actually had female leaders. Yes, they? indeed. Uh, all three of us have had. And in India, I, I would say, and I'm sure it's the same for Bangladesh as well, we've, we've had uh, ambassadors to, um, to most of the, uh, uh, you know, important countries, to challenging uh, uh, you know, assignments. We've had, I think, two women ambassadors uh, to the US. We've had a woman ambassador to China. Uh, we've had several in Africa. In fact, I've been ambassador to Africa twice um, in, in the Middle East, uh, as it is called, we call it West Asia. Uh, so most parts of the world, we did have a number of women going as ambassadors. Somehow, uh, in, the, in the UK, we didn't. We didn't have any foreign service women come here before. Um, so I suppose it was uh, the chair was waiting for me. <laughs> well, we have a female prime minister for the next few days, and then who knows? <laughs> um, so we're in good company. But obviously, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't ask you both about Brexit. Um, and in particular, uh, to you, High Commissioner Rushi, um, the UK has, uh, over the last three years, um, extolled the virtues of having closer ties with India in a post-Brexit world. How do you think those ties would look like? Well, you know, it's a little bit difficult for me to uh, start projecting at this stage. But I would say this about uh, India-UK relations. Our relationship is uh, based on very strong foundation. India and UK have a very, very strong strategic partnership that spans so many different areas, whether it is uh, strategic cooperation or cooperation in the area of defense or education or uh, science and technology research. I mean, you name it, and there is either a working group on it or there is some work that's going on. There's good economic relationship. There is a very strong Indian diaspora here. Uh, that is uh, doing very well. A large number of Indian companies are here. We have, uh, in fact, this year, uh, a recent report that was released uh, says that this, uh, we have a record number of 842 Indian companies uh, in the UK. And their uh, combined turnover last year was 48 billion pounds. And they paid around 680 million pounds as uh, corporate tax. And all these figures are up, actually, over the previous year. So we have a, a very strong relationship. And as I see it, in India's relationship with the UK is not really based on UK's relationship with anybody else. So uh, I think. Uh, the status of UK, whether it is in Europe or whether it is out of Europe, I think we will find ways to uh, keep this relationship going, to keep it uh, strong uh, and taking it forward, because it's a relationship that's really important on its own. Um, Hi, Commissioner Saida. Obviously, countries like yours also have to balance, as uh, the High Commissioner Rushi was just saying before, 
the need to keep good relations with Europe at the same time as obviously keeping good relations which countries like Bangladesh historically have long-term relationships with the UK. Yes, well, our relationship with actually, you know, when we were, um, we came into being as a country in 1971, became independent, um, the two countries who recognized us during our war of liberation, when we still didn't, were not recognized by the world, number one was India and number two was the United Kingdom. So Bangladesh flew its flag in London during the war of liberation in August and in India in April. So therefore we have a very, very deep relationship with these countries, both the countries. And uh, our relationship with UK is based, is a value-based relationship. So there are common values such as human rights and democracy, uh, secularism, which is a very strong pillar of Bangladesh's identity. As you know that we had, we wanted independence because we were suffocating in an Islamic Republic of Pakistan and hence we were born as a people's republic and secularism, democracy and nationalism are three pillars of our constitution. So hence our relationship with Britain, Brexit or no Brexit, um, you know, will, will continue to remain very strong. And um, you know, we currently we have a very strong trade partnership for Bangladesh. Britain is the third largest export destination. We have about five billion US dollars of trade. And uh, we, Britain is also the third largest investor in Bangladesh. So every year we have 200 to 300 million investment from the United Kingdom. Last five years it was two billion US dollars that UK has invested. So definitely trade investment, uh, you know, our common prosperity through bilateral trade investment is going to be the main focus uh, post Brexit. If there is Brexit, even if it's not, it's going to be remained the same. There's a large diaspora as well. We have about 700,000 plus uh, Bangladeshis living here. Let's start taking some questions from the audience. Um, please raise your hand if you've got a question for our two High Commissioners. Just uh, be aware that, uh, I'm aware that you're both um, members of the civil service, so obviously that's right. when it comes to political questions, that's gonna be uh, sl slightly more touchy territory. Do we have no a problem. question for <laughs> either of our guests? Well, I'm going to continue actually, because um, High Commissioner Saido, just continuing on what you were saying about uh, the relationship between Bangladesh and the UK, um, you were previously an ambassador, to High Commissioner to Thailand, and I believe you were quite successful in raising investment, reciprocal investment and export figures. What's your plan for the relationship with the UK and Bangladesh? What kind of an I think UK is make? already looking at you. You see Bangladesh has been termed by McKenzie as the is going to be the largest one of the largest sourcing uh, uh, you know destinations for the world. So UK will continue to look for sourcing and manufacturing in Bangladesh. We are currently exporting the biggest part, 80, 85% is ready-made garments and apparel, but we want to, we do want to diversify it. We want to export more pharmaceuticals to the UK. We want to export more environment-friendly jute and diversified jute products to the UK. We believe there's a market for that. Currently, it's coming from India, but also we also export a lot of raw, raw jute to India, but we should be able to supplement that exports. And, um, you know, cycles and other, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, leather products, cycle, and tea. So these are the things that we are looking towards diversifying, and we're having a trade investment conference around October this year. I'm taking the initiative to do that. So it's, um, we're going to find new ways of expanding our bilateral trade. Um, also, we're encouraging the United Kingdom to export more to Bangladesh, because the exports are very low. It's the balance of trade is in our favor. So uh, investments, trade investment, and also you know, IT is one sector that UK is not looking into Bangladesh. We are outsourcing major, we are a major outsourced country for Nordic countries and Western European countries, and we are a shipbuilder, but we haven't built any ship for the UK. So these are the areas that we're going to expand our bilateral trade investment cooperation in the future. And as you were saying earlier, yeah, I believe you share an electricity grid with India. These types of trust partnerships, uh, between obviously a, a very large country and a slightly smaller country um, that share borders, they're crucial, aren't they? But there appears to be a trust deficit in many countries around the world. Isn't that true, uh, Commissioner Rishi? How much does that concern you these days when you hear so much of the kind of negative rhetoric, politically speaking, particularly coming from the biggest Western players in the world, like the United States? Well, <laughs> trust deficit, I think, is something that uh, people have to uh, focus on and work on. Uh, and that's, uh, I think that's something that's not limited to any one particular country or one particular region or one particular uh, time. Uh, trust has to be built over a period of time with the uh, consistent, uh, you know, relationship, consistent engagement. Uh, Saida was just talking about 
uh, the trust that we enjoy in our relationship uh, with Bangladesh, which is not a work that has been uh, achieved overnight. It's a work over uh, several decades that the two countries have been uh, doing. So in any relationship, uh, to build the trust uh, comes out of engagement and, uh, and a mutual desire to take the relationship forward. And I think uh, having uh, mechanisms that help you in achieving that uh, is very useful. So, <clears throat> so for instance, with the UK, we have multiple dialogue mechanisms and uh, joint working groups. And in each sector, uh, when the experts of the you know, specific sector engage with each other, it helps in building that uh, relationship of trust and relationship that helps in taking, uh, you know, not just uh, that particular sector forward, but the overall uh, relationship forward. So I think I would look at uh, that as, you know, a trust deficit has to be something that has to be worked on to create a trust, uh, you know, credit. I mention this because Bangladesh is quite an interesting example of how some of your neighbors, for instance, like Bhutan and other countries that are landlocked that you share borders with, you you allow them we to allow use them to use our ports yeah. which is i mean i think in particularly for bangladesh which is a small country with a large population extremely uh, you know power hungry space hungry country and large population and will continue to grow we have a demographic dividend that will continue until 2040 so our population might double by then and for us it's extremely important to be connected to our neighborhood so connectivity is a major foreign policy priority and uh, Ruchi was mentioning about the power grid I mean with the India we have about 50 levels of institutional cooperation mechanisms we have home ministers uh, forum we have border guard forum we have district administration forum why because you know we have road connectivity rail connectivity through bangladesh to the other side of india from kolkata to agartala in tripura in in assam um, and with bhutan and nepal the landlocked countries so we allow our ports to be used by both bhutan nepal and also india we are allowing india transit and transshipment these extreme trust issues so I think that uh, if you have to have a win-win relationship and you want win-win collective prosperity, you have to stay connected. So connectivity, um, you know, and um, tourism, energy and power grid sharing, I think these are the forte of our relationship and our regional cooperation. Is there one uh, question from the audience just before we wrap things up in the next minute and a half? Um, the, we were talking there about, uh, about, about the issue of trust um, and some of the issues that are on the table, particularly obviously with Bangladesh. I presume that, High Commissioner, you've had to have many conversations about the plight of the Rohingya people um, with, yes. with the UK. Um, these are people who may never end up returning to their homeland. What's the nature of in your... And why do you say that? Why do you say that? That is the Myanmar is their that, homeland well, and they have to the, go back. That's Myanmar has to be accountable for taking care of their minorities. And uh, obviously, Bangladesh, uh, being a humanitarian country, we have faced a similar situation in our War of Liberation in 1971. There were 10 million refugees that took shelter in India. And similarly, we opened our borders for the Rohingyas because they were being, there was mass influx in three months. We had 850,000 Rohingyas coming into Bangladesh in the fear of persecution and life. But of course, we are in a dialogue with Myanmar. And uh, speaking of trust, you know, while with India, we have 50 different forums of engagement. With Myanmar, we only have one. So I think over the past five decades, it's been extremely, you know, we're trying our best to build this different strata of relationship with Myanmar. And we are interacting in regional forum. But I think uh, we need to work on that area more. And more importantly, uh, you know, Rohingyas have been persecuted, women, has been, women have been raped. We, have, we are sheltering rape babies, 60,000 of them. And I think uh, accountability in international community and our bilateral engagement both are extremely important. And we continue with that. We are optimistic that uh, dialogue will lead us to some place and Rohingyas will be able to go back. No. They must go back. Time is up, but thank you very much for that, uh, Commissioner, High Commissioner Saida. Time is up, but just before we go, I want to address the real great balancing act. Um, we're all mothers, I believe, of sons um, with high-powered jobs. If they were watching you right now, just in a sentence or two, each High Commissioner, what would your message be to your sons? 
to see you on stage today. I think my sons and my husband both, you know, I, I couldn't have been here without their support. It hasn't been easy. It's actually a struggle. It is actually rather a war every day. It's like a conflict zone. <laughs> but, you know, you have to win every war and you, you have to try. And with family, you actually eventually win every war. Nothing, is, not a, nothing goes to loss. Everything is a win-win situation. So I love them. That's what that will be. You know, I just thank them for their love and support. I would also uh, have to say the same. Uh, I don't think I could have done it without my husband and my two uh, sons. In fact, uh, every time uh, I have a challenging moment, I find that just being with them, um, I don't always share my problems. I don't know, that's a weakness, but I don't have to share because uh, somehow, uh, you know, they can sense that I'm in need of comfort. So it's really without them, I don't think I could have uh, done this, the sacrifices that have to be made by the, by the family. Uh, of a working woman uh, who is in a very high demanding job. I think those are never, uh, never really uh, accounted for. Nobody thanks uh, the family for what they have missed out because uh, while I was working, my children were missing out on their time with me. So I, I too would uh, just want to say thank you and how much I love them. And I'd like to say thank you to the audience. <laughs>